Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. This is a really special episode for us because we have reason to expand our topics of conversation. If you've been following us for some time, then you know we've been speaking with artists who are working on the cutting edge of technology in film and television really since we started this show eight years ago now. Then we expanded into music and video games, and now we have an entirely new, exciting topic to discuss. Podcasts. Yeah, obviously podcasts have been around for a long time. Even this one, like I said, we've been going for eight years now. So why are we suddenly covering podcasts on the Dolby Institute show? Well, earlier this year, some news articles started to pop up, like this one from The Hollywood Reporter back in May. It announced that Wondery has released podcasts in the Dolby Atmos format via their Wondery Plus app. We'll have a link to that full article in our show notes. But in the meantime, I want to help explain to our listeners and viewers, if you're watching this episode on YouTube, what exactly this means and why we are so excited about this news. But before we dig in too deep on this, we wanted to have a quick chat with my colleague, Tina Ekman, the Dolby Content Relations Director, to give us a quick overview of Dolby Atmos, just to set some context. Here's Tina speaking with the executive producer of our show, Jack Ferry. The question I get asked a lot from my friends, which is, uh, what exactly is Dolby Atmos? Yeah, that, that is a good question to start with, for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's our innovative sound technology that we've been using from the time of cinema, where we first started, right, in cinema. We've moved into streaming, we've done music and gaming, and, and now we're in podcasting. Object-based audio, essentially, is the technology behind what Dolby Atmos is. And it's a way that creatives can lock in their creative intent, right? So with objects. So thinking outside the speakers, for example, um, and being able to place audio exactly where they want the audience to hear it from and not only control where it is, but kind of how big it is. And it's, it's a nice creative tool to be able to like visualize where the sound goes, um, the Dolby Atmos panner that's in the mix room. But with that said, the... With Atmos in general, clearly creating the sound to be an ac accurate, immersive environment, but it's also a format that then will deliver to devices, whether it's a mobile device or a living room or a cinema. So how is it that it's able to still create that fully immersive soundscape at, on my home theater? I think that's touching on the algorithm and the format itself, being able to um, condense or compress or push the audio into the right speakers that are available, depending on where the consumer is. And it, it is definitely magical. Um, clearly, there's going to be some differences if you're sitting in a, a cinema where your seat's rumbling. <laughs> it's going to feel a little different. But man, is it amazing to hear those sound bars. And uh, some of them have more advanced technologies than others but they all sound pretty dang impressive and they're just giving you the best experience that makes sense for you as a consumer. So not everybody wants to hang speakers in their living room or wants to invest in, you know, certain type of headphones, but in the most cases we can deliver the best audio for the consumer, depending on what devices they have. Let's go even smaller because this is an episode <laughs> about podcasts right. and how, you know, Dolby Atmos is now available uh, on certain platforms for certain podcasts. Um, we started at the top of this episode talking about Wandery and how they're able to actually deliver podcasts in Atmos. So my question to you now is, how do you get all that Atmos sound in a little cell phone? <laughs> that is very interesting, right? Again, it's the algorithm. Um, being able to distribute based on what number of speakers you have. Uh, we are super excited that Wondery was able to release a platform that supports Dolby Atmos. Um, clearly, there's only a handful of them right now that are doing that, but more are coming. So super excited about creatives embracing Dolby Atmos and working to create the the vision, so to speak, of what their soundscape should look like and trusting the fact that Dolby Atmos will deliver the best experience possible. Yeah. So in order for people to experience it, um, let's say they want to listen. Like, so the, one of the episodes that, or one of the shows we're going to be talking about on today's episode on Wandery Plus is Who Killed Daphne? Oh. So if a listener wants to experience that series in Dolby Atmos, mm -hmm. what is it they need? 
the Wondery app, the Wondery Plus app, right? So that is enabled for Dolby Atmos now and a pair of headphones that are also Dolby Atmos enabled. So there's several different versions of that now and you'll be able to hear just about everything. You're telling me I'm going to have like that fully immersive, you know, yeah. cinematic experience. Yep. Despite the fact that I'm not in a movie theater with a billion speakers. Yeah. I, and I'm telling you, even at Dolby, I'm still taken aback sometimes when I hear heard that for the first time. It's just, it's a really immersive different experience than what you're used to hearing on a pair of headphones. And it's, it's pretty amazing. Now, I hope that gives you a decent idea about how Dolby Atmos could be applied to podcasts and how you as a listener can experience these podcasts in Dolby Atmos, which is why it's probably a good time to ask you now to put on some headphones, please, because throughout this episode, we're going to be dropping in clips from several of the shows that we're talking about, all of which were mixed in Dolby Atmos, so you can get a taste of just how cool these podcasts can sound. So for best results, please use a pair of headphones for the remainder of this episode. Now, you might be asking yourself, why would podcasts even need immersive audio? After all, podcasts, such as this one, they're just interview shows, no? Well, that's true, but it's just for a narrow slice of the podcasting landscape. For some greater context, Jack also sat down with Steve Wilson, who worked for Apple all the way back when podcasts were part of the iTunes store, and he's now the chief strategy officer at QCode. There's still a lot of education needed out there as people are being more and more introduced to the world of audio, but uh, just like how you know TV and film you know, or books or a format, uh, or, or a medium, excuse me, there's lots of different formats that exist within the medium, and so... Uh, within the world of audio, of course, we have interview shows like what we're engaged in now, you know, variations on that, whether it's a, a round table uh, kind of format or recurring kind of, uh, you know, co-hosted podcast. Um, but, you know, th there's all different kinds of shows really, um, you know, and devices to take you into to audio. Uh, Q Code's really trying to bring in a cinematic approach to audio and, you know, uh, kind of take some of the best of, of TV and film and blend it with the audio world. And so if you think about TV and film, of course, you have great, you know, interview uh, hosted shows, but, but also, you know, big prestige event series, you know, like your Game of Thrones and Westworlds and, uh, you know, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel's. And we're trying to bring in that kind of event series cinematic moment uh, to the world of audio that people would really look forward to listening to uh, and, and kind of talk, talk all about uh, at any given time. In the world of podcasts, people have gotten a great uh, taste of this, you know, in narrative nonfiction, um, you know, fantastic shows like Serial and Dirty John, Dr. Death, Missing Richard Simmons, Dolly Parton's America, so many uh, that come from the world of nonfiction. Uh, what we're really focused on, um, you know, and really the founding of Q Code is, uh, is, is, is truly fiction. So uh, we do a lot of uh, shows with big Hollywood actors, uh, but in all different genres. So everything from sci-fi and horror to a female erotica with Demi Moore, a kid's show with Matthew McConaughey, but really, um, you know, taking some of the, um, the, the foundational elements of early radio drama, but bringing them and putting them together in a, in a modern, modern kind of production sentimentality. I'm glad you mentioned radio dramas because that's, I think, what most people think of when they think of like uh, scripted narrative audio programming. Um, obviously, like the most famous or notorious example is probably, you know, I'm going to say War of the Worlds. Um, you know, was this radio drama what in like the 30s or the 40s, right, that like kind of caused a panic because people thought it was like a real broadcast and that, you know, Martians have landed. Um, but I think people would be curious to know um, that there's a whole new generation of that sort of radio play. I don't know. What, what do you actually what do you guys call that? And can you kind of talk about how it's evolved now you know, nearly 100 years later? Yeah, these are very common conversations. I often find myself talking about, you know, War of the Worlds with modern production techniques is a line I say probably every week. Um, so there's definitely a level of education needed. Uh, it's worth noting, by the way, that while, uh, you know, audio drama, you could call it, declined in the U.S., it's, it's actually remained popular in other parts of the world, including in, in, in the U.K. But in terms of your question on what we call them, I mean, often we use just fiction podcasts at Q Code because, um, 
audio drama tends to imply just drama. And we have, again, we have an an 80s inspired action comedy with Lamorne Morris uh, from New Girl and Billy Magnuson, who's in the most recent Bond movie. So um, we we tend to just use fiction, I guess, as the umbrella uh, for those series. And um, and yeah, we're still doing quite a lot of uh, education, helping people understand that this is a different kind of experience that they can have in, in audio and an alternative uh, often to screen time. What is it you hope to gain by bringing the immersive audio experience that Dolby Atmos technology like provides? Yeah, it's it's been a, such an amazing journey working with you guys at Dolby and uh, truly predates me. Um, Q-Code was founded by a guy named Rob Herding, our CEO, uh, he was a longtime talent agent uh, working in Hollywood uh, with lots of uh, creators and directors, writers, and helping them bring new original stories to life. Um, and he was so passionate to to uh, to bring out new ideas into the world. And at the same time, you know, that's that's pretty hard. You know, he was often uh, trying to put together TV shows and film and, you know, getting through that that wall can be difficult um, as, you know, naturally Hollywood is... Um, you know, risk adverse with the kind of budgets that go into TV and film and uh, uh, have aligned themselves a little bit more towards proven franchises and sequels and, and those kinds of things. But as much as we all love uh, a good sequel, um, we, we wanted to try and put together new stories. And so Rob had fallen in love with podcast and with scripted fiction uh, audio and really saw a path to create new original, again, you know, cinematic stories in audio, um, as we like to call them. And um, that was the genesis of Q code and, and, you know, going along with that vision, when you think about bringing in a new, uh, you know, narrative story that, that might originate um, maybe as a original podcast idea, maybe as a TV or film idea, but then you bring in high end talent, you need that, that world to sound immersive and cinematic. And of course, you know, when you, when you think of high end audio, you think of Dolby and uh, so Rob reached out, I think it was in 2019 to start that conversation around what does a a Dolby Atmos mix sound like in podcast and how can that elevate this kind of audio experience? And so I think that was the the real genesis of our company's relationship and and how we've been working together since that time. That's excellent. So taking it back to the war of the worlds example. So um, obviously modern fiction podcasts sound very different. I mean, that was probably like a mono recording coming out of like a single speaker um, so for people who might be new to scripted narrative or fiction podcasts, um, what is, how is it different now? Like, how does it sound different? Yeah, well, you know, the, the beautiful thing about mixing in Atmos is, is you're really designing in a spatial environment. So, uh, our team, you know, is able to think about how, how objects sound around the listener in a, in a spatial environment that's additive to the to the storytelling. Um, so it's not just about, yeah, that mono experience, let alone um, stereo, but really, you know, we try and be thoughtful about how we use the technology to, to enhance the storytelling and, and, you know, immerse a listener into the to the actual world of the story. So, um, you know, we can think about specific scenes and, and moments in time that, you know, really will benefit from that, that kind of, uh, you know, engagement. And, and just by way of an example, one of my favorite uh, things that we've done in Atmos was for our show Electric Easy, which is um, a, a sci-fi uh, musical uh, starring Kesha and Glory Bailey uh, and Mason Gooding. And there's a scene in, in the podcast where um, a mother is teaching a kid to ride a bike. And, uh, you know, it, it, as you kind of imagine kids often learning to ride a bike, you kind of just do like small little loops, uh, you know, on a driveway Uh, In the scene, the kid's kind of getting their confidence and then ultimately starts to uh, move around you uh, in in the mix. And you can kind of hear them learning to ride a bike for the first time, but actually moving around you, the listener, which just feels so, um, again, so immersive. And like you're you're the mom or you're another person kind of standing in the driveway witnessing this uh, and the way that it's kind of playing out um, in in space around you. You're holding me too tight. Oh, okay, there you go. That's it. That's it. I'm doing it. Well, I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm going to let go now. Let go, Mama. <laughs> as you slipped Mama. out of my hands, I felt longing, sharp as a tack. And then you were off. I'm doing it. Oh, I'm riding the bike. Mama, look. Yeah. 
<laughs> I see. <laughs> I see. <laughs> not, not, not too far, Sa Sasha. Honey, slow down. Being able to transport people to lots of different environments and not have to um, think about those budget constraints that you would have in in, in visual mediums. Uh, our um, head of development loves to talk about just being able to ride in a helicopter crash without having to think about that that budget. But uh, you know the 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 imagination and the doors are, are really wide open in terms of what we can facilitate in audio. Uh, we think a lot about transporting people through time and you know flashback sequences or taking people to the Roman Forum, and you know we have a lot of exciting uh, things ahead that will make you really start to think about the world of audio in a lot, a uh, lot different sort of immersive way. Um, and, you know, th that's one of the things that we've really uh, tried to do a lot across our teams is bring in sound designers and editors who have experience putting together worlds in different forms and fashions. So, you know, that includes, you know, people who've worked on Tenet and Dunkirk and these other uh, big TV shows and, and, and movies, um, but bringing that same cinematic quality to, to audio uh, in podcasts. That's amazing. So, so for people who still think of podcasts as, you know, like This American Life or Serial or you know, I guess the most famous podcast right now is probably the Joe Rogan podcast. Um, you know, they're really only experiencing a small sort of subset of what podcasts are. So why should they be excited about what the potential um, you have with Dolby Atmos in, in crafting fiction podcasts? Yeah, I think it's a really an opportunity for a different medium that you haven't experienced yet. I mean, when we think about our stories, you know, they're they're almost like books in a way where that really unlock your uh, imagination to see the world in the way that you you imagine it. You know, uh, TV and film can be very prescriptive, and you know, a character looks uh, a certain way, and and you know, you know, books really offer that opportunity for you to think about how a world looks or a character looks uh, for yourself. And that's, that's part of the, uh, what makes that experience enjoyable. And, um, you know, there's so many things competing for our visual attention today, you know, YouTube versus TikTok versus everything that's streaming right now. And, th and that's wonderful. But, um, but I think this experience that we're making is, is different and allows you to, um, you know, make other kinds of life choices, if I could say that, like intentionally go for a walk or, you know, play one of these podcasts uh, while you're folding laundry and, you know, uh, have have a different kind of experience in your life than uh, than, than than a news driven chat show or, or certainly just other things, again, competing for your visual attention. While Qcode has been focusing on utilizing Dolby Atmos for their scripted audio dramas, Wondery, who you heard me talk about earlier in this episode, they're mostly known for a different genre of podcasts as the company behind hit shows like Dr. Death and Dirty John. Their new series called Who Killed Daphne? It's another true crime blockbuster, but because it's not a fiction series, they've been utilizing Dolby Atmos in a slightly different creative direction from Q Code. Here's Jack again, speaking with Marcelino Villalpando, Wondery's head of sound. Like what is it about Dolby Atmos that's exciting for you um, that maybe, you know, sort of like supercharges your uh, ability to tell, uh, different kinds of stories or stories in different ways. Like what is it about it that, that to you really gets you excited about having the ability to deliver these sh shows in Dolby Atmos to your audience? Um, I, you know, I'd have to say just the, the perspective that we now have from a, from, from like a sound design, um, element, like for example, um, if you're thinking of, a, say, imagine somebody walking through a marketplace and, and the camera angle is kind of seeing like a medium section shot and they're walking from the side like a 2D. But I feel like with Atmos, we, if we just a little mind, a little mindset shift, you can now put the, the camera from the perspective from like maybe up here, like as if it was like a GoPro and you get to like walk through and you get to experience that market. There's going to be things below you. There's going to be things above you, behind you, or in front of you. Things just kind of running like say you know a kid runs right in front of you or something like now you can you can experience that from the listener's point of view and that's just the sound design i mean if you take um for example in in our one of our newest series daphne um about the uh maltese journalist who um 
investigated the government for for corruption and, and money laundering, and then uh, tragically died in a in a bombing. And the the story, uh, in a, excuse me, in a, in a in a car bomb accident. And the story essentially takes you through that story as we try to find out who the killers are. Um, and what what the reason I bring that up is because the cool thing about Atmos and and in terms of like, so Wondery, let me back a little bit. Wondery, we're known for our, our criminal uh, investigative series, uh, Daphne, you know, Dr. Death, Dirty John, um, series that um, traditionally may not be, may not lean into Atmos as much, right? Um, and so that that is an interesting challenge because maybe you may not have as many uh, like, point of view, like little character scenes where, where maybe they're, they're running through the scene as much, although Daphne does, but in general, they, they typically don't. And so we get to do things like take music stems from a score and, and just envelop you uh, in, in, the, in the tension. So the sound designer, so Daphne was mixed in stereo by Michelle Macklem, and then the stems are sent over to our, one of our sound designers, uh, Jeff Schmidt, who's doing the Atmos remix. And so Michelle, was able to find cues with these, with like layers of stems, like I'm like six uh, different seven layers of stems. And so when when you're building a scene out, say you want to build some tension, now you can place like say you place the bass in front of you, you can place the melodies up on top, and then you can just have some some synth tone just kind of go around you. And and there's a there's a scene where um, the, uh, the the car bomb scene that I think is probably one of my favorite scenes from a sound design. Um, perspective in the in the series um and and the way michelle she designed that scene no really no literal sound effects other than like the the fire um kind of burning kind of going around you um but there's no like you you feel the explosion you don't really hear it as much and and everything else is just being heard with the music and so um jeff did a great job at just kind of building that tension ever so subtly um with the music and not really having to rely on so much like literal sound effects he ran across the field towards the flames, praying to himself. Please God, please God, be another car. I couldn't see the number plate. I couldn't see the color of the car. I couldn't tell what kind of a car it was. I ran around and in the front I could just make out one of the hubcaps. And I saw the logo of Peugeot and at that moment I thought, shit. We hope to be doing an even deeper dive on who killed Daphne in the coming weeks. So please make sure you are subscribed to this podcast so you don't miss that episode. In the meantime, you can experience that show right now in Dolby Atmos on the Wondery Plus app. You'll find links to that show as well as to all the shows we mentioned in today's episode in our show notes. But for now, let's get back to Jack and Marcelino. When you're doing a fiction podcast, you know, you're creating an environment, right? Um, you're creating like a New York City apartment or you're on the, the deck of a spaceship or something like that. You're, you're effectively creating these, these immersive soundscapes to put the audience right there in the center of the action. But when you're working on a, a crime podcast about real events, a show like Who Killed Daphne, you know, you want to put your audience in Malta, which is a real place, maybe in the courthouse for the trial or in, you know, the church for her funeral and things like that. So when when you're going to design something that's fictional, um, how do you use the the tools that Dolby Atmos provides you to, to put the the audience there? Yeah, that's a great question, because um, first thing you mentioned right now, you mentioned the funeral and, and in the funeral scene. Um, there is a, a clip, I, I want to say it's a YouTube clip of like some, it was the, the Maltese national anthem, I believe. And it's and it, and sung in, in such a way that it's very, um, it's just very eerie. Um, and and it, it does a good job at creating tension for that scene. And so what, how um, Michelle addressed that was kind of taking that mono restore, uh, recording and then just kind of having it sway back and forth. And then having tone just kind of build underneath. And then meanwhile, having the, the ambiences of maybe some birds and some wind as if you're actually there. Um, and these birds, they don't necessarily, she does a great job in, in the series of making birds sound not quite like birds. You get that whole, um, what's it, the uncanny valley uh, situation happen where you're like, is that quite a bird or is it a bird? But that little, that, that 
that's um, that moment of like un uncertainty just builds tension. And then translated over to the Atmos mix, Jeff was able to, again, make the, the birds kind of fly up here, make you make you make you make you feel like you're there. And, you know, at, at the at the, the funeral, having the, the voices way back and forth, kind of not so much deafening, but just kind of uh, surrounding you. And then, of course, you have tones that you can layer in and kind of um, just help build that that extra layer of tension. The the coolest part to me, I think, about Atmos is it, especially with the the criminal investigative series that we do is that it's it's leaning into the subtlety of it. But then, in one moment, one man just shouted out. Ah, no, we do justice, yeah. So justice, we want justice. And then they began singing the Maltese national anthem. So how do you and the sound designers and the mixers then make that decision as to like, where exactly do we want the listener to be in this scene? Like, do you have conversations about that? Like, you know, do we want them to be, do we want them to feel like they're, you know, in the the jury box in the courtroom? We want them to feel like they're in the back of the courtroom. We want to feel like they're on the witness stand. Like, how do you make those determinations? And what is it about like the Dolby Atmos then, you know, provides, you know, for the audience then, uh, like what kind of storytelling tools does it provide the audience then when you when you make those decisions that maybe you didn't have at your disposal before? Right, right. Um, I mean, I love that question. I, I think it all starts off with the with the way the script is written. The script, like like I tell the, all the writers and producers at the end of the day, like the sound designers, we're just coloring in uh, the the drawing, you know, the the, the the drawing that they already sketched out for us. Um, it really depends on like how the the story is written. Is it, and, and that determines the, the point of view. Is, is that going to be from, are we going to be in the jury box? Are we going to be the actual lawyer? Are we going to be um, kind of a, from the bird's eye view? Um, and essentially what's interesting about that is that I do, I, we do find, not all the time, but sometimes if there's a scene that's pretty difficult to sound design, usually we end up going back to having to rewrite it because um, maybe the writing didn't lead into the sound design as much. And I think what, in terms of like the Dolby Atmos tools and the capabilities, I mean, again, just the, just the, the clarity that you have with the sounds, right? Um, it allows you to, like, say if, if, if I am in the courtroom and say you wanted to be, um, maybe you want to be the, the killer and you're nervous. Like, how, how do we convey that to the, to the, to the listener, Right. Do we heighten the maybe his breath? Do we heighten the the um, his seat uh, moves, his sweet seat movements? Do we heighten the 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 room tone, the air condition? Do we do we add a, a certain layer of like hollowness? How, like how do we want to convey that? And I think the cool part about Atmos is that we do have that extra added layer of of clarity um, to play with, right? Um, I, I remember. So one another series I worked on was called Jacked, um, and that that was another series where we we did it in stereo, and then that ended up getting remixed into Atmos by a really talented sound designer named Chris Jenkins, um, who he's I, to my knowledge has been doing Atmos for quite a bit. So he he he's the one I remember having a first conversation with him, and he mentioned just the art of subtlety. Like when we asked him about the creative approach, he was like, "You don't want things to be uh, panned all the way right and left, and all the way high and, and low all the time." You, he got away for the certain moments. And I remember in the very cold open of episode one, he, the way he like was able to, cause uh, for those who aren't familiar with Jack, um, it starts off, uh, it's about new Jack swing the story about the music genre, new Jack swing. And, we, and we're placed in a, in a concert. And so there's a lot, bunch of layers of, of, um, of crowd noises. And just like the, the way he was able to like separate the crowds as opposed to when, when we did the stereo mix of Velvet, he squashed, and then you were able to have folks just pop out left and right. And then the way he was able to kind of, um, he, he did some cool stuff for the transitions where he like pan the, the, the audiences and it, and it gave you like, it, 
it was so subtle that you're like, it's something you, you like didn't trust yourself if something was happening. You're like, what's sounding different? And it was just like, but it sounded so cool. You didn't quite know what was happening, but it just sounded so cool. And, and I think that added layer of, of the, the depth, the width and the clarity that the Atmos format uh, provides you. I mean, there's just so much opportunities you can do. The fans didn't know. It was like a conundrum. People was like, okay, wait a minute. It was confusing. Hey, that was worse than anything. Instead, Timmy watches his former bandmates as they go on stage without him. And now, he's watching as the crowd at the L.A. Coliseum go off. Guys' dreams have come true, but not Timmy's. That was a clip from Jacked, another podcast with an incredible Dolby Atmos mix from Wondery. Since we're talking about how Dolby Atmos creates a next level immersive experience for listeners, we also wanted to know if the way people listen to these types of podcasts might be changing. So here's Jack and Marcelino again. The way people consume podcasts, obviously, is often different than the way people consume movies and television shows, you know, other uh, media that's that might be mixed in Dolby Atmos. You know, I think I'll just use myself as an example. I love to listen to podcasts when I'm on a walk. I listen to podcasts when I'm like washing the dishes. Is there ever any concern that um, because you're creating this, you know, fully immersive soundscape for people that um, there's sort of like competing realities, you know, where it's like, here I am in the real world, but I'm also, you know, in Harlem in 1989 when I'm listening to Jacked or I'm in, uh, you know, Malta in 2017 when I'm listening to Daphne. Um, like, is there ever like any concern about, or is that, is that even a, a factor when you're, when you're designing these shows? So the very first time we mentioned Atmos, uh, we brought the conversation up. One of my colleagues, um, <laughs> that's the first thing she asked was like, Hey, uh, let's make sure not to make, make it sound too realistic in case people are driving. And this was way before cars were even a conversation. And also reminded me of the very first time I started working at Wondery, our OTO, Hernan Lopez, he had a rule where you couldn't have like police sirens at a certain um, decibel level, or he just like anytime he would flag anytime there's a police siren, just because like for that, if people are driving, uh, you don't want them to think they're getting pulled over, right? For some additional perspective on this, we also sat down with Sandra Yi Ling, the executive vice president of production, and Ben Milchev, the head of mixing, both at QCode. Well, I'll tell you, you know, having been working, you know, have working in this field for almost like two years plus now at QCode, um, you know, exclusively with audio dramas and, you know, uh, quote unquote, what I call like the, the radio plays in the modern age, you know, um, I personally cannot listen to any, any of our stories, any scripted narrative stories in a car or while I'm going anywhere. For me, it has to be an experience where I'm either sitting down or laying somewhere comfortable with a nice pair of headphones or, in an environment that sub- supports that immersive playback in order to enjoy it. Otherwise I find to me, you know, m- moving and going about my day feels distracting to, you know, from the story. So uh, I personally, it's, it's for my preference. I, I like to stay still and like really immerse myself in the story. And, you know, in turn, when I work and mix these stories, that's also the mindset that I go in, into with. When I'm listening um, to one of an, an immersive podcast, I do, I actually, ha- I can do either in that I can, like at nighttime, especially, I really love being in bed and listening for 20 minutes, like with the lights out and feeling that immersion and being able to focus and like, having that instead of like reading a book right um because it's obviously just a little more exciting for me but I will say I can do it while I'm doing the dishes when I'm going for a walk it is you I don't think you get the full uh because there are there are noises around you um that are from the real world so I don't think you get the full immersive experience but in something that is well told And something that is supported, like where you still can have that, like you still have that high quality of sound, 
you can get immersed in it. Just for me, the trick is you have to be doing an action or a task that is repetitive. Like I can't be driving. So I think Dolby Atmos is so key because you are placed into a world where sounds feel like you're in a cinema and you have that cinematic experience where something can genuinely feel like it's coming towards you or from around you um, through trickery of the brain. You know, we base and we ground our podcasts and our and our work in in reality, in the real world. We we focus on presenting the story in an immersive way, but immersive not immersive in a real way, as if the listener is actually in the story. Dolby Atmos comes in as a tool that it just enables us to do that immediately. You know, as soon as we place our um, our content in Atmos, we'll all, we're all it already feels as close to reality as possible, at least to me so far that I've heard. You know, I've I, I haven't experienced anything as close resembling to, you know, what I'm actually hearing on, on a day-to-day basis um, than when I work in Dolby Atmos. And, you know, in part, I think that's why the reasons why I can't, you know, listen to our shows while I'm doing everyday tasks, because oftentimes I'll be like, wait, I just heard a siren. Was that outside my window? Or did I put that in there? And then if not, I'll have to go check, go to my computer, open up the session and see, you know, like, is there actually something there or am I like imagining this or is this outside? It, it's, it's happened countless of times, you know, where, where, you know, I've had people tell me, oh my God, I thought there was actually a dog barking across the street, you know, but no, it's actually just something that our sound designers put in there. And I think that spatialization, that low, you know, super precise localization of sounds that Atmos gives is is absolutely crucial and key to, you know, uh, doing what we do. So it's interesting. You, you say you like to put the audience there. And that's actually like one of the very sort of specific questions I have is, you know, with a film or a television show, it, it seems like the sound designer and the sound mixer have the advantage of the camera, right? The camera is effectively the eyes of the audience. So you'll know, like, where do we place the sound of that, you know, that jet that's coming from behind the, you know, it's like, well, that the camera's facing this way and the jet's coming like this into the screen. It's like, we know that we, we started, but, but how do you know where to place the, like the, the listener? Like, for instance, like when I listen to listening in, um, which is very well mixed because you really do feel like you're in this person's apartment. Uh, which is ironic too, because it's a show about, you know, listening in. Um, but you feel like you're in this person's apartment. And so like someone's, you know, in the shower on like, you know, the left side of the apartment and, you know, maybe they're on their computer on the right side of the, like, it really does feel like you're, you're, you're really setting an environment just with the sound. But how is it that you determine or do the, or the directors determine or the writers determine like where you want the audience to be and what you want their perspective to be in that, you know, in that environment? So. I'll start off at first by saying, you know, by comparing our medium to film, and I feel like this will will guide our our listeners on this podcast to better understand what we're dealing with, and that is that the absence of picture acts as both of a it acts as like a kind of like a double edged sword because on one hand it liberates us from you know from from being confined to a picture to have to follow the picture. But on the other hand, the the possibilities of what we can design and what we can do are endless. So, you know, so we need to find that delicate balance. The way we do that is in film, you have your directors of photography, you have your, you know, location scouts, you have your, you know, I don't even know <laughs> who else is involved in the production here. Um, <laughs> but um, on our end, those people get replaced by the sound designer, the dialogue editor, the mixer, the uh, co- the the composers, and so we have active conversations with our creators even you know before we go into production. On on say I'll take listening in as an example. We're in an apartment. Okay, how big is this apartment? Is this apartment you know a penthouse? a uh, seven bedroom apartment in New York or is it like a shoebox uh, at on the second floor that you can hear a lot of noise coming in 
So these are all details that we have to kind of figure out before we even start designing um, so that we so so that we accurately build the landscape and we um, uh, build the geography of the story according to the director's um, vision. What are you doing? Hey. Uh, oh my God, don't tell me you're still on that nonsense from earlier. No. No. I, I was just moving the furniture and had to unplug it. What kept you so late? God, these new tests. I still have to finish up a report. Henry wants it tonight. I'm sorry. Your dinner's probably cold. Do you want me to heat it up? I'm not hungry, thanks, so. though. I just need a shower. It's like a fucking swamp out there. It sounds to me like what you're saying is you're creating your locations out of whole cloth in the post-production process. Like, I think when some people... Because the sound design is so good on that show and the mixing is so good on that show that I think a lot of people, when they listen to it, will assume, oh, they must have recorded this on location. Um, but in reality, it's not true, right? Like you bring the actors into a sound booth, record all of the dialogue and everything like that, right? And then you create the footsteps and you create the soundscape to make it sound like we're in you know, an apartment or we're, that we sound like we're in an asylum for classified or we sound like, I'm assuming, you know, in the wilderness in blackout, right? Is that, that's how it works. Yep, that's, that's exactly correct. Yes. Um, and, uh, what I was going to say, oftentimes, you know, directors will give us pointers to, you know, we want, these are the elements that we want to hear, but the kind of like, I would say the true immersive aspect of our stories really comes down on the mixing stage where, it's honestly up to our discretion as mixers and uh, to decide whether, you know, a car is going to pass from left to right. If, is a car going to pass, sorry, left to right uh, in front of us? Is it going to pass uh, on the left side from the back towards the front? You know, if there's a bird or a dog, is it going to be on the right side? Is it going to be behind us? Those are all creative decisions that we make in the mix. Got it. Now, now here's the thing that I think is really fascinating because I think uh, storytellers love these new tools, and but it's but it's new. Like we haven't really experienced Dolby Atmos in podcasting for a very long time. So I imagine that you know your directors and your writers are really excited to be like, oh, what more can we do to put the audience there? I want to know. In the last several months, let's say, when you've been w working with this new technology, what new storytelling opportunities were opened up now that you've got access to mixing these shows in Dolby Atmos? The first show that comes to mind to me was Electric Easy. And if you haven't listened to that one, I would strongly recommend it. I've, I feel like that's one of our best uh, soundscape, soundscape and mix wise, that's one of our b best shows. The creator, Vanya Asher, he he really took that show and I think, in my, in my opinion, from, from what I saw at the back end from the mixing stage, he used the medium to tell the story as opposed to telling the story through a medium. Um, and he did that in a, in a couple interesting ways in a sense that if without, you know, spoiling too much for for listeners that for that haven't heard that story is you know each show is from a perspective from of a different character and each sorry each episode is from the perspective of a different character and in doing so he decided to set these kind of ground rules if you will to establish what that perspective feels like and in doing so it's kind of actually funny because we say we ground our shows in reality but when in fact everybody's reality is different or at least slightly different from one another so what vanya did incredibly well i think was he showed us you know seven or eight or 
different realities within one show. And I think that was a phenomenal way to, to really utilize the medium to even more enhance the story. Omni, there's a pipe by your leg. Daddy, stay back. Stay there. Is that all you got? Oh, shit. Effo boy falls on his bio ass. Son of a... Skinner! Wake the hell up, Skinner! Make him bleed, Omni! What's the play, you dumb bag of bones? Huh? The bio boy crawls away from Omni. Omni lifts the pipe above his head. I almost get my hands free of the ropes. No, 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 no. Hey, 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 a little help here! It's a very personal experience, right? Because you are wearing headphones, you are wearing AirPods, earbuds, whatever you want to call them, right? Um, so it, it is a completely personal experience that is about your reaction, not just to the story, but you can you start to believe like these characters can literally be in your head. Like we had um, a really well received podcast called Soft Voice, which actually won for the writing an Ambi Award because it, it, it's very good. Um, but like that that is a great example where this is about a woman who has who actually has voices in her head, right? Um, and there are times where it actually feels like, oh, she's she's right here. She's right next to my ear. Or I would say in some of our horror horror scripts, um, sorry, our horror shows, those can be very intense, especially if you do it the way Ben and I do, like lying down in a dark room um, to have that experience. Because, oh, I tell you what, Jack, sometimes it feels like, did that creepy character just whisper in my ear? Like it can be that kind of concerning with that level of intimacy, the way that Ben can play around with the levels um, specifically in Atmos. So I think that those moments do make it very unique um, very and very personal uh, because I think, you know, while it is abs like it's so much fun, we're talking about going into a cinema, we're talking like, and enjoy having that shared experience. This is a solo experience on your earphones. So it can be in some ways deeply emotional. It can like really tap into your fears or your personal um, sort of stuff without the interference of somebody else. Last year, she had bought her very own one bedroom apartment on Curtain Road with its own jacuzzi bath. But it wasn't only at work that soft voice made Lydia win. It was everywhere. For example, at yoga. Push the floor away, twist, windmill the arms, exhale, chaturanga. At being a plant mother. Water the ivy, mist the fern, spit on the cactus. At badminton. Smash it. At marathon running. Go, go, go! Life with Soft Voice was a kaleidoscope of wholesome activities. That was a clip from Soft Voice from Q Code. Let's get back to Ben, who sees a bright future for this technology and podcasting. Before there was stereo, there was mono. And, you know, when stereo came about, if you were still working on mono, you were just falling behind, if you will. Feels to me like the whole industry is slowly but surely, or, or in some cases not so slowly, you know, shifting towards Atmos. And for one, it makes me very happy to see that because I do think that this is an absolutely incredible piece of software and an incredible uh, tool for creators. Um, but, uh, two, it's, you know, it's just where, where the industry is going. The limits are being pushed in that directions and Atmos is at the forefront. So if you're, if you're not pushing the limits, then you're just falling behind and, and it's, it's hard to stay competitive and deliver that high quality, you know, product if you're just not pushing the fronts. Yeah, that's totally it. Like. I mean, Q Code was established. Um, we, we were, look, we were not the first production company by any means in the podcasting space and scripted, not at all. We were early, um, but the way we wanted to really focus and and make sure that we were competitive and doing like high quality shows and standing out for that is by doing the best version of everything frankly. So we work with excellent writers. Um, we work with excellent directors. We have top level talent. Um, we are not the only people doing this, obviously, but that is something that we really pride ourselves on. But it doesn't stop at that. 
we we have excellent producers, we have excellent engineers, we have a top like a really high quality team with people who specialize in every department, but you have to make sure that technology wise you are doing exactly what Ben said as well is in pushing those boundaries and doing the best that is available the be- and and then pushing beyond that to say like okay well maybe the the you know atmos isn't available in that specific app in you know but it will be so why aren't we doing it yeah we're doing it because it will be and then we'll have almost our entire catalog will be that much better for it um so i think that that is what we always try to achieve at Q Code, um, and I think we do a good job, honestly. Um, and that is a huge part of a huge part of it. And yeah, that's excellent. Thanks. Um, I'm going to get a little controversial now uh, because I want to address something that comes up occasionally, um, it, which is, what is it you say to people? I'll, I'll, let me preface it with this. You were talking about how first there was mono and then there was stereo. And I mean, this is before my time, but even I know that like when like, like rock music producers were starting to, you know, incorporate high fidelity audio, you know, there was complaints by some of the purists who were saying like, oh, this is just a gimmick. This is just a gimmick. High fidelity is a gimmick. Obviously it's not. Stereo is, you know, pretty much for, for, for decades, it was the standard when it came to like produce, you know, producing pop music. But I even remember like, you know, like the, the, like the original Beatles albums were all recorded in mono and it was like later that they then remixed them in stereo and people were like, oh, it's too gimmicky. We don't. Um, and I feel like this this still keeps coming up when, when new technologies come around. Like I feel like it came up when 5.1 came around. Everyone was like, oh, this is just a gimmick. This is just a gimmick. You know, obviously, I don't believe that. But what is it you say to people when they ask you that is like, well, is this whole Dolby Atmos thing just a gimmick? Honestly, my response is, have you listened to it? Have you heard it? Have you actually done your research? You know, because it very often just stops there. They, you know, people, people, you know, read a couple of headlines and then they assume things and without doing the actual research, if somebody, if, if somebody comes to me with the research, then I feel like it's a little bit more of an open dialogue and, you know, we can dive into different points of what makes, a uh, you know, what would make Atmos gimmicky or not, or even though, it, in my opinion, it's completely like absolutely like, you know, the the new frontier, if you will. Um, but most importantly, I would say, you know, the the actual products, the the content that we create, I think, speak for themselves for for itself. You know, and I'm a huge um, ambassador of show and don't tell, so. You know, if, you know, I'll reference with, you know, with 5.1, you know, if music didn't catch on in 5.1, I, I, you know, so far I'm seeing like all the, the top industry musicians, you know, music celebrities and music artists, they are doing stuff in Atmos, you know? So it's just a matter of time before those purists, quote unquote, you know, like accept that, okay, this is where the whole industry is shifting, at least in my point of view. Can I can I add to that? Um, in terms of yeah, early early conversations with creators when we're thinking about what Atmos has to offer, you can have that conversation where it usually for some, like a TV writer, for example, not an audio writer because they should already know this, but like a TV writer, um, you know, they're used to thinking about point of view of like a camera. Um, and because they write very visually. Now, we don't want them to write visually, but we want them to think about physical point of view, characterful point of view and physical point of view and how those play together because we can create with Atmos, we can create that point of view. Is your character like looking in from the corner at something that they shouldn't? We can, we can, make, we can deliver that um, in the mix, you know? Is, is your character, like, um, in the middle of a car crash where all of these intense sounds are happening in different spots and places far away and close, right? We can deliver that. So that is a very key thing, I think, that has a great opportunity is really considering 
character point of view from every aspect um, and how that physical aspect can enhance the emotional. On the creative side, you know, the challenge is that you always have to learn. You always have to adapt. You always you always have to experiment and you always have to push the the your, your personal boundaries of what you thought was possible creating um, with Atmos. And for me, it started with, you know, grounding everything in reality because reality is what I know. You know, I know how I'll, if a car sounds, you know, two feet away from me or if a car sounds 50 feet away from me. So I know how that sounds. And from there, I start to build my, um, if you will, my repertoire of, of uh, you know, tricks like an illusionist will. You know, we often refer to audio as just like magic and illusions and stuff that we do, you know, voodoo, <laughs> if you will, to, to trick the brain. And it, it, you know, it just goes, sky's the limit from there. Before we wrap up, we wanted to take a moment to talk about the widening adoption of Dolby Atmos. Right now, it's available on Wondery Plus and on a couple of other platforms, but what needs to happen in order for it to be available even more widely? Here's Tina Ekman from Dolby again. Well, we've done this before. And actually, when I started working at Dolby, streaming wasn't really that big of a thing yet. And what drives that whole initiative further is the artists, to be honest. Artists coming to the the different platforms and saying, we want our content delivered in Dolby Atmos. I mean, clearly consumers also have a huge impact. We have seen where platforms have enabled maybe one Dolby technology, but not the sound technology or, you know, not Atmos. And there was backlash in chatters and, you know, different Twitter and all, all over the place about we want Dolby Atmos. And, and that made an impact as well. But I think far and by far the artists coming in and saying this was mixed and at most we want creatives to be able to hear what we are designing that makes the biggest impact so what's the advantage of listening to a podcast with immersive audio in dolby atmos on a supported app like wondery plus okay so the advantage for sure today is headphones um many podcasters podcast consumers listen on headphones working around the house or, or whatnot, kind of an individual thing. I think the second most popular place is actually cars. And the Dolby Atmos format um, allows you to shift between different types of listening experiences. So Wondery available on your phone and then playing through car speakers. And there are a couple cars that are in market today with Dolby Atmos hopefully more coming um, and you get the, a truly rich experience because it's using that Dolby, Dolby algorithm. I expect very hundred percent that we will see either casting and or apps um, available on Apple TV or fire TV or other devices or even televisions directly where you'll be able to have podcasts in the living room um, so that you can experience it as a group, kind of like those old radio TV dramas. So Again, the Atmos format creatively allows you to do all kinds of amazing things. But as a format, it doesn't matter what you're listening to today. That's going to evolve. It always does. And Atmos will deliver the best version possible to whatever device you're listening on. That seems like a great place to end things. I want to thank once again all our guests for today's supersized introduction to Dolby Atmos for podcasts. Thank you to Tina, Steve, Marcelino, Sandra, and Ben. And thanks also to Jack, my colleague and executive producer for conducting the interviews for this episode. And thank you to our friends at both Wondery and Q Code for providing all those amazing clips from their incredible series. Be sure to check out our show notes to find links to all the shows, but also to learn more about how to best experience Dolby Atmos when listening to your favorite podcasts. And thank you, our audience, for joining us to watch and listen to these conversations here on the Dolby Institute podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to us. You can find links to our dedicated podcast feed also in our show notes, or you can just search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back soon with more of these deep dives into the creative process with filmmakers, showrunners, musicians, game designers, and now podcasters. Thanks again for joining us. Sound and Image Lab is brought to you by the Dolby Institute. 
I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you again for listening.